Yeah, actually, actually, this got me thinking when you said about uh, imagining the failures. I was I had an honor to see a lecture from Dalai Lama some years ago, and he said that he goes through his death I think sev- seven times every morning. So basically, he's <laughs> he's imagining his death every morning, and I thought that he's a pretty balanced person. And I think after that, I have started to do imagery for kind of horrible things and and for some reason it it is really really nice thing to do in a way it sounds weird that you imagine your own death but it really brings balance it really brings gratitude what you are and and i think also considering imagining like what is it if my company gets bankrupt I still have the people around me. It's not a big thing. So it kind of reduces stress. Uh, do, do, do you ever go this far in the imagery that you go really like, for example, thinking about your death? We we, we wouldn't um, in a nutshell. Uh, we we usually go as far as, um, as achieving your purpose. Mm. So that we, 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 we try to keep it as positivist as possible in terms of um, that goal but what usually happens is people you know I, I would say we're, we're in we're, we're, we've got high success rates at the moment I'm sure it will change because you know we're, we're working with certain populations at the minute um, but people usually usually achieve goals and then go on to set new ones so mm. we are always trying to um, support them to imagine what reimagining would be like in a weird way um, but yeah, we never overly focus in on on that timeline. I, I have come across lots of. I mean, we we do use in a way some kind of timeline basis. We'll say where where is your long term goal, and again, for a lot of people, um, you know, uh, it's it's often grandkid focused, like playing with grandkids, and I want to make sure that I, you know, or even family based. Uh, um, I want to, you know, my core value is family. I'm a family person. I'm a social person. I want to be able to ensure that I provide for my family. And, you know, and for their family, if possible, as well. So we focus in on that point of, you know, what, what's that like? What is that mm-hmm. goal like? Um, and then we work backwards. OK, so what are the KPIs from that goal? What, what, what are the other smaller goals? So we call that meso imagery. So what are the, 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 me, the, the medium term goals? Mm. Some people um, using imagery based on long term goals it will be very, it'll be uncomfortable. So if you say, you know, what's your long-term goal? They may say, my long-term goal is to, um, thinking of a guy I worked with the other day, uh, is is climate change. I want, I, I want to save the world. Oh gosh. Okay. Let's work backwards. Cause that's, that, I mean, what's it like? Let's experience it first. Um, and then we work backwards and we'll say, right, well, you know, what, what's a, what's a manageable goal? A manageable goal is maybe in a year's time, I want to be able to, you know, uh, in my household, be, you know, c- carbon, whatever. Um, or I want to be able to reduce my recycling or my carbon footprint. And, you know, I want to re- cycle to work more often. Okay. So if that's your goal for a year or for two years, you know, what's it like in six months? Like, what, How would you know that you're on that right trajectory to achieving your goal? Oh, well, that means I would have had to have brought a bike. Okay. So let's work back again. So again, you know, I think having those big goals sometimes are overwhelming and they they can produce stress. So working backwards and saying, right, well, what, where's a manageable point to start off with? Um, it really does help to, there's always going to be stress with a goal, but mm. to alleviate the stress slightly and to also start with action. So, you know, I think anything to do with, I think, again, motivational goals must be action centered. So what can you? What are you going to do right now to actually help you tomorrow and the next day, and you know two weeks on and, and six months on, etc. So I think again, if you can make it as um, specific as possible for those immediate goals, it's hugely helpful. And again, what we often do is we use cues. So we'll get you to do cues. You know, right here in, in where I am, I've got my my coffee cup. You know, and as I uh, boil my kettle in the morning or as I you know as, as I hold my first cup of coffee I'll hold it in my hands and that will cue my imagery for the day so right mm. okay what are my obstacles today what's coming up okay 
obstacles are X, Y, and Z. Cool. Um, how can I overcome them? And then what can I do right now? Like what if I, when I put this cup down, what am I going to go and do? So it will always have to end in that kind of sequence. Mm. And the reason why we use cues is because is because cues trigger thoughts. You know, if you pick up your phone, that's going to cue a thought. If it dings, that's going to cue it. Oh no, not another email. Okay, how does it make you? So so again, these cues are ways to to trigger um, memories, but also to plan for a future use. So again, that's really important in how we use behavioral cues to then set up this kind of activating imagery and then this process of then carrying something out. Mm. Yeah. So I, I think many of our listeners are working on sedentary behavior and physical activity. So how would you use this in this case? Like what would be the first steps to to use it? Yeah. So we always start with motivational interviewing. And that, that is a real, uh, that's the fundamentals of functional imagery training. So we'll always start with a motivational interview, purely to engage in conversation. So there are four phases or processes in motivational interviewing. Um, so if you're not if you're not uh, aware of them, uh, uh, the first phase is engage in conversation. So build rapport. The second phase is focus, which we would generally have a broad goal. And then we would focus in on one specific goal. And then we evoke motivation and then we uh, we work with individuals to plan. And the reason why this is, this, this, is, this works really well is because we have uh, a, a human tendency to plan quite quickly. We want to support other people. So, what, you know, what I always see when I when I train people is people generally um, want to want to fix something. But that's generally the worst thing that we can do as psychologists or as practitioners. So. Um, give people space, just develop rapport, connect is the first thing I would always say to individuals, just, just connect with your client. Don't worry about the fancy stuff. Just connect, have a conversation, get to know them. You know, even things like, what are you reading? What books are you reading? Because that will tell me a lot about that individual. Okay. And what music do you listen to? And what are you watching on Netflix? And what are you, you know, so all these questions will actually um, start developing rapport. So that's the first thing is that motivational interviewing is really important for the way that we deliver imagery. Imagery really for us starts in on um, uh, focusing on something very uh, specific. So one target goal. We use a lot of primers to say this is what imagery is and this is what imagery is not. So we see imagery as more holistic. So people quite often think that imagery is just visualizing. So visualizing is one part of imagery. So we get them to experience imagery, um, so cognitive imagery, based on you know the the sound of the of what you might hear and then the, the taste perhaps, um, the kinesthetics, you know the movement of what you're doing. So we really immerse that individual. What we also know is is that some people are not very good at that skill. So if we say to some people, you know, can you imagine an apple? They'll say, not really, no. So again, we would then work with those individuals to then increase their imagery ability. And again, we can we can increase that. We can say, can you imagine biting an apple? Can you imagine the you know the smell of an apple? Can you imagine if you threw it in the air and catching it? And we would then look at all these sensory ideas, and uh, and work with individuals to then um, hone in their ability to use imagery more effectively. Hmm. But the the key thing for us is always once you've got that. Um, once you're working on a specific goal and you're focusing, we then look at, well, let's really immerse yourself in experiencing that goal, positive and negative, and then again, working back to um, behavioral intentions as well. So as a starter, for anyone listening, I, I would absolutely say develop rapport to start off with. Um, what people generally come to see me uh, for is, is not the specific goal. So again, give it time. Rely on kind of your, we, you know, in, in MI, we have, you know, open questions, affirmations, reflections, summaries, rely on your skills, enable that, that those individuals to actually explore these areas themselves. Um, and they're kind of introspecting as well through space. Um, so allow them a bit of time to reflect. So, you know, in research, it's tricky in research, Ollie, because, you know, we, we, we've only got a few amount of sessions to run in research or it's a single session intervention or you know, it's tricky. 
you know, in the real world, you, you might be with a client for six months for a year, you know, so have that freedom as well, just to, you know, set tasks and to check learning and imagery really is two way. So as mm. the individual starts to learn how to use imagery, you then become the student and they become, you know, the, the practitioner in a way that, you know, so what's, what was it like at the weekend when you're doing this? What would it be like next weekend if you're going away and you're going to this, you know, or, or next session when we're in the, in the gym or, you know, whatever it could be, you know, so focusing on those, on those areas of recall and then like more fantasy based, what would it be like in the future? And mm. yeah, give people time to explore how they're using imagery and get them to explore ways that they, you know, that they can teach others and you um, on how they're using it. And then mm. what we usually do for the planning stage is we, um, we then use cues. So again, you know, in the morning when you're waking up, um, you know, as, as you're, as you're getting out of bed, uh, before you, your, your feet touch the floor or as they touch the floor, just go through your day, you know, go through the obstacles, take some time to be present and where you are and then play out the day. What things are coming up? You know, how can you plan better yourself? So again, you know, that following that sequence is hugely beneficial. And if you're, a, if you're working in any area, um, I would say, yeah, just just rely on those on that sequence. So evoke, um, focus. Uh, sorry, um, the sequence is uh, um, is first off. You need to yes, right. <laughs> is um, yeah. So rely on those, on those four processes. So as as you as you start to engage in conversation, engage, um, focus on a, on a specific area. Evoke motivation again. That's where we use positive and negative based imagery, and then um, and then allow the person to plan themselves. Hmm. And, and I think again, there's there's a lot of you know we, we we know that we need to eat healthily, we know that we need to exercise, we know that we need to do certain things. We know that. So you haven't got to tell the individual. Also, you know that you need to eat more vegetable in your diet. They know that. You know that you shouldn't be drinking lots of alcohol. They know that. You know that you should be sleeping for. They know that. So again, mm. um, you know, just just ask questions on. You know, how's your quality of sleep? You know, inquisitive questions. Ask questions around. You know, um, how's your diet going? Don't give them advice on you should do this, mm. because more advice actually sometimes could be detrimental. So just allow that individual to plan for you, and you'll hear it as well. You'll start to hear things, and they'll say, you know what? I've thought about. Um, Drinking more water. What do you think on that? Hey, I think this is a great idea. Drink more water. What does it look like to you? Well, I've heard that drinking, you know, a couple of liters a day is really helpful. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Maybe, maybe you should try that. Oh, okay. So again, all you're doing is you're just you're just affirming what they already know as well. Mm. Yeah, I, I think a lot of, lot of good points there, and I think the building rapport is is important. And many times people go straight into into the theme. But that's that's a good point. If we go to practical terms, like let's say quite many people are now working still at home and and having quite many Zoom calls, and probably they are sitting a little bit too much, not exercising enough, and and then we would have a health and fitness professional who tries to change this kind of behavior, sitting a bit less, moving more. Mm-hmm. How would this go? You you said that you listen the person, but if you if we imagine a a certain case how how would it go what kind of cues you would use how would you make people motivated to sit less or or do these these health behaviors yeah um well i i i think that um i mean that's that's a question that's kind of baffled people for quite a while in terms of like what to do and, and how to do it um around sedentary behaviors and especially if you've got a desk job where you're you know, you, you are over a keyboard for X amount of hours, um, you know, a day is very, very tricky. Um, so I think that people generally know that what to do, Don't, uh, not to give them any direction, of course, as well, which is obviously breaking my rule. But I'd say, um, you know, if you have time to stand up, if you have time to go for a walk, to get into nature, if you have time to, you know, and, uh, and even if that's five minutes, like five minutes is perfect. So I think start small. Um, we we often use cues. So again, you know, back to if you've got a water bottle near you, 
that that is the ideal what we often use to say you know um if if you're if you're drinking you know every time you 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 have a, a sip of your drink again um you know can you do it standing up can you have a quick micro stand up shake your arms out anything that you can possibly do to actually stretch and just to get out of your seat for a second and walk around um or 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 you know make your flask one of our guys a similar thing where he would have a big flask of water and found that he wouldn't get up as often and then he switched to a smaller vessel a little cup which meant that he had to get up and go and fill it up so things like that are really good interventions to just get out your chair but at the same time um you know if you've got five minutes in your day where you can go for a walk around your building if you've got um you know any time at all to go to, 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 to just to get out of your chair it's hugely beneficial hugely beneficial so don't feel that and this is what i often hear with with, with my clients is that you know well what's five minutes i thought you're gonna do a great deal or you know well i i could i could go to the gym on my lunch break but you know it's getting changed and it's getting showered and getting back into like even if you're going for for 10 minutes for 15 minutes amazing so don't I would say don't put a time limit on it by in, in, in a way. Just put the activity. You know, if you've if you've committed to it, if you want to get healthy, then start small. Start with a single step, and then um, and then yeah, any kind of intervention around, you know, size of your cups or you know, again, if you're in in a network of people who go to the gym, you know, we know that you're more likely to to go if you're in a if you're in a group as well in a, in a communal you know work group. So all these things that you probably already know um, are hugely beneficial as well. But st- even stretching at your desk is also very good. So, mm. um, but again, I think people generally know that. But go, you know, well, finding the time to do it or just remembering to do it. So that's why we use cues. Mm. And and I think people, like you said, people know what they should do, but it is not getting it done. Uh, You said that, for example, you make your first cup of coffee and the coffee mug cues you to think what are the obstacles. Would you in this case kind of have, for example, that every morning you look at the calendar and you plan that when do you go for a walk? When is it's a long stretch? What do you need to do to achieve that day, day, daily goal? Would you would you do it in that way? So I, I, I would like to. But I'm really unorganized, with my honesty. So, f- so for me personally, um, planning to the nth degree doesn't really motivate me personally. Mm. Right? Mm. Um, some people, that's that's how they operate. They have to put everything in their calendar, in their diary, and they would follow that through. Um, some people don't really like that regimented effect. Um, so, yeah. So I would say get. To, and this is why rapport is really important. Is um, If you can find a way that works for for yourself and for your or for your client, then um, and then make it into a routine if possible. Um, again, cues for me re- are really effective. So just reminding myself, you know, if you've got an Apple Watch, I'm sure that it buzzes at you and tells you to stand up and to breathe and all sorts. So again, they're, they're cues for you to then start to um, refocus your attention. But yeah, I mean, again. I'm not sure, Ollie. I'm not sure whether you're a meticulously planning person, but I, you know, for me, definitely, um, I like the serendipity, the randomness of going for a run and finding an hour in the day every so often and and getting out. Um, but I'd also say that what we know is, and this is probably the be- the better point actually, is um, plan for tomorrow, today. Hmm. Don't plan for today today. Hmm. So yeah. Uh, so you know what we know with our samples is that um and definitely for the for the studies that we've conducted around the ultra runners is that ultra runners they they plan for tomorrow today they will go right where's my running kit where's my shoes right i'm going to put this by the door i'm going to put my running pack by the door i'm going to put my gels by the door so when they wake up in the morning there's no ah oh, i've got to go and find my shoes and, oh my socks aren't dry so Limit that. Limit those excuses by um, by giving yourself the opportunity to, where possible, um, uh, yeah, you know, be, be more effective today for a tomorrow. You 
And that's that's a huge benefit. So I'd always say plan a day ahead. Mm. <laughs> I, I, I have five pairs of running and training shoes right next to the door. So they are always there. I don't, <laughs> no need to plan it for the day before. But yeah, good good points. And and if somebody is interested they to do a motivational interview with their customers and start using this, you kind of described how it goes, but is there a good resource how to do it? How could people learn how to do a good motivational interview? Yeah, there, there are courses that you can go on to to to, to, to do motivational interviewing. Um, so you 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 can if you Google it, you'll find 101 courses. Um, we run a course as well. We run a course at the university, and also at uh, with imagery coaching as well. We run a course which is a kind of more of a um, condensed course over five days that you can then learn not just motivational interviewing but also imagery as well. Um, so we know that, that the imagery, the the motivational interviewing part. It's hugely beneficial, but we also know that functional imagery training is around four to five times more effective than just motivational interviewing. Mm. So, and that's for weight loss. This is for resilience in the military. This is for um, ha- healthy behaviors. Um, so the imagery part is the real game changer for us. Mm. Uh, and again, we we run courses on it. Um, and I think our next course is in, in June as well which you can find out about. So, um, yeah, that's, yeah. So I think that's the, 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 more, the more structured approach. Again, as I say, if you, if you were to Google various things, you can find 101 courses out there on, uh, on motivational interviewing. Um, the other important part, point to say as well is that um, it should, where, possi- where possible, be fidelity checked. So the quality of what you do really matters. So again, if you're going to train with someone, make sure that they are, They've got a good background in motivational interviewing or imagery training or similar. So that's a real important takeaway as well. Mm. So, so you have a course. Is it online or how how do you do it? Yeah. So uh, on imagerycoaching.com, you can find out all the details um, online. Uh, the course is on Zoom, and we've we're on our fourth course next in June. Um, we generally get a hu- people from well, obviously all over the world, um, but we get, uh, yeah, it could be health and wellness practitioners, it could be psychologists, researchers, um, doctors. We've, we've had a few surgeons who have come on with us as well around supporting with decision-making, um, athletes, performance directors, um, or people who are just generally interested in, in you know, coaching and upskilling themselves around using this this method. Um, but it's all, it's all uh, I, I want to say new, but it's not new any, anymore, really. We've got a lot of research in these areas, um, and we've been really proactive across across industry, across universities as well, to make sure that what we're doing really matters. You can replicate it, um, and yeah, and our course, um, yeah. I mean, I, I enjoy teaching it, as you can probably tell, um, and yeah, we got we get great feedback as well on you know from all of our practitioners. So you go on and you know again work with companies, work with work in gyms, work in, you know, uh, healthcare facilities um, all around the world. Mm. So it's it's online, it's several days. Could you tell a little bit more about the structure? How much is it about lectures, workshops, yep. practicing? Of course, yeah. So uh, it's five days, uh, mostly on Zoom. So uh, there is a another online platform as well that we can give you video to support your learning. The five days, day one is primarily motivational interviewing. So we, so we go through... It's around 30 minutes worth of a lecture, kind of uh, um, um, uh, or like a workshop. And then you get to practice and we give you scenarios and we work through each of the four um, processes and we give you all of the MI skills to go alongside it. Usually we have people who know a bit about MI, so they're not, it's not all new. Um, and we're really refining their ability to use motivational interview on the first day. Um, so that's three hours that we usually run it. So um uh in uh in british time it's i think it's two till five to so three hours um uh, for the course and then if you're uh eastern time based and it's nine in the morning uh so just for three hours and then yeah, yeah we we do, we do like a, a mini workshop kind of lecture kind of start into into breakouts practicals and that kind of repeats itself over those five days but gets into more depth and again what the aim is is that by the end of day five um you're able to use the model that you feel very comfortable using this kind of process driven model um and what we do which is very unique to us 
we don't just teach it um, to individuals. We also do MI and functional imagery training to teams as well. So from my point of view, working in, in the military, for example, um, I have to I have to do my um, my motivational interviewing and my, my and my imagery training to groups of fifty people. So again, if you're working with big groups, there are different techniques that we use, which is day five of the course, um, to get the most out of refining imagery ability, increasing effort and motivation through big group workshops as well. So we've got loads of research as well that we go through for that. Mm. So did you mean that you do the course for the big groups or that when you are coaching, you have a big group? Oh, uh, when I'm, so, so, um, so I'm, I'm part of the, uh, the, 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 um, the team that deliver the, the all, all the training. So there are two of us, um, there's a guy called Carol Nedza who works uh, alongside Joe and myself. And we, we work on the, on the five day program. Mm. Um, but I'm the one that goes out in, in terms of the, the applied work um, and does the research around the the group based interventions and again we've got a couple of papers out which are um, with big teams that we've worked with and it's a very tricky thing to do um, using imagery for big groups so again um, again we've had a huge success with our research prog- program but again it's been a real journey of like sometimes it doesn't work um, and we've had to refine what we've done per team and we've had to make it into a, a rigorous rigorously checked approach so then when we teach other individuals, they can hopefully get the same benefits. And that's what we're seeing at the minute with our with our global team is that they are getting, um, yeah, the, the, the same effects on big groups mm. using imagery training. Yeah. And, and when you have a bigger group, do you do the motivational interview individually or do you do it as a group? As a group. Yeah, as a group. All right. yeah. Which is tricky in itself because um, we, you know, historically motivational interviewing is very much um, one-on-one. So we we uh, we're often given a group who's generally got a specific goal. Mm. So if I'm working with a uh, a sailing team, they're going to have a certain goal, or or an F1 team or whatever, um, they're going to have a specific goal. So we go through values, beliefs, etc., attitudes. We look at cognitions and we work with individuals. Sorry, with 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 teams, and they share they share their goals. They share their um, they they share their values. They connect, um, and they become their own kind of uh, um, trainers, I suppose, in a way. So we we give them a, a, a method to follow, which gets the most out of those sessions. And again, you know, in the research world, it's pretty quick, mm. um, but in the applied world, you know, usually it lasts for for, for six or seven weeks when we go through, um, yeah, group based motivational goals, and then specific refining and measurement of imagery. And then you know, te- uh, and then upskilling them in imagery, and then retesting again to look at the benefits over time. Mm. And and when you go this with the group, how do they they come and do they lift their hand and somebody says, or do they do it as a work group where they yeah, write, it, write down? It's more like a work group. Um, so it used, when we used to do this, it was like that kind of more hand hand uppy. But we know that it doesn't really work. So what we did is we changed it to. Um, I do like a task for two or three minutes uh, and then they go into big uh, breakouts. They might be in groups of two, they might be groups of five and they share, to- they, they discuss topics, they explore motivation, they explore values. Um, again, hugely based on all the motivational interviewing research for groups. And then we've got a, a, a way to um, to connect them pretty quickly. Like I was saying about phase one rapport being mm. hugely important. We get them to connect. Mm. Off, straight straight away f- f- find something meaningful in common uh, but also they have to share vulnerability they've got to share something which has importance to them it can't be something you know on the minutia which isn't overly relevant so we we've got a program that we teach individuals um on the mm. course but then in the applied world when we're doing it yeah it's um it's full on I, I, I'm, at the end of it i'm sweating i'm it's, it's a lot of hard work <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I'm thinking this uh, the applica- applicability of this that I think it works probably well for a let's say F1 team. They are all together. They have a common goal. Could you see that this could work, for example, if you have a group of pre-diabetic people who who have a common goal, probably that they don't want to get type two diabetes? How would it work in this kind of? Thing? It's exactly this, exactly the same as you're saying. That there's normally a common goal, and actually, it's more empowering 
for individuals to share their common goal in a group. So it might be obstacles and struggles that they might have. And again, in that open conversation, if we're in a group of 50, we break them down into smaller groups. And the smaller groups usually have very similar conversations where mm. one person will say, this is my obstacle, this is my struggle, this is the issue, this is the reality of it. And the people will generally say, that's the same as me. That's what I that's, that's how I struggle as well. Except for me, it's slightly different because you know, and they start to share these ideas, and that is hugely important. And again, I think, you know, um, is it more powerful than the individual MI based session? Um, sometimes it probably it probably is because they mm. connect really quickly with someone who's going through something which is very similar to them. Um, and rather than me sitting there opposite, you know, talking about their goals, they can then share ideas. And again, a lot of people would have said, I've tried before, but it hasn't worked. You know, well, how do I control my thinking? I, don't, can't, I can't do it. I just find myself automatically doing this. So again, it's, and, and in groups, they'd usually come up with a lot of amazing solutions. So restructuring thinking. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point because it's about scalability. Like yeah. you might have an intervention that if everybody would have a personal coach 24 seven, they would be super healthy and they would achieve all the goals, but that's usually not the reality. So this kind of scalable approach for a motivational interview and, and maybe inventory training could be, could be really interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's where we are. We're in this kind of area now where in the territory of being really excited because a lot of our results are, exciting our group work our clinical work that we're doing as well um is is hugely valuable and exciting for us because we're seeing real real change over time um and we're seeing people stick to you know really a, a, a agreed goal or you know personally agreed goals we're seeing weight loss um studies you know uh, people keeping the weight off over time so we're seeing a lot of interesting findings for through what is generally a, a very straightforward uh easy, easy to teach intervention Hmm. Yeah, really, really good discussions and it would be interesting to continue, but I think we are running to our end of our time. So thank you, Jonathan, for taking the time for this podcast. Thank you very much, Oli, as well, for having me on. And uh, thanks for being so open and and, uh, and allowing a very good uh, discussion as well.